number five have been withdrawn. I call Mr. Paul Given. Mr. Given. Question number one. The Office for National Statistics estimated the net fiscal balance to be £9.7 billion in both 2016-17 and 2017-18 and £9.4 billion in 2018-19. However, about £3 billion of this relates to so-called non-identifiable spending. This is made up of things like British Government debt repayment and military forces, which are not specific to this region. There is also an accounting adjustment of over £3 billion that is attributed to the North. Setting that aside, that leaves a gap of £3.3 billion between the revenue that is raised locally and expenditure that is clearly identified as benefiting citizens here. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. The figures of £9.7 billion and then the most recent one of £9.4 billion by way of the benefits that Northern Ireland has in being part of the United Kingdom, the wealth of that great union brings to this place is something uh, that is of significant value. It equates to the Department of Health, Education, Justice and Communities combined if we did not receive the support that we uh, receive from the Treasury. Given that the Irish uh, government, the debt that exists there is the third highest in the world per capita at over 200 billion euros, the crises in health and housing that led to his party uh, getting the election success that it did, and the research that has been carried out by the Liverpool University that support for Irish unity is only 29 per cent. Is it not time that Sinn Féin got off the issue of a border poll and moved to making this place work for the benefit of all our people for this country remaining within the United Kingdom? Minister. Well, I congratulate the member for managing to ignore the answer that I gave him previously uh, and go on with whatever he had intended to say. Uh, it's a skill in itself. The uh, ONS themselves say that public spending that directly benefits citizens here is £21.8 billion, while the taxes raised here are £18.5 billion. And that, for me, is the immediate gap of £3.3 billion, which needs to be bridged, and not as wide as £9 billion, uh, which is not the reality in cash terms. ONS add in a share of that money that is spent by London on things like defence and British government debt, and then they make a complex accounting system to make the books balance overall. That is not spending the executive nor most of our citizens would ever see. So while I know he wants to cling to the larger figure, it is actually just an accountancy process. The, the difference, as ONS themselves, who provide that £9 billion figure, say, between the, what is spent directly for citizens here and the taxes raised is £3.3 billion. Mr Matthew O'Toole. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, on a related topic, um, the Minister has talked a little bit in the past about the creation of an independent fiscal commission, a little bit along the lines of what they have in Scotland. There are a range of views and, and um, depictions of public spending in Northern Ireland and its position relative to the UK Exchequer. Does the, Prime Minister, does the Minister sorry, agree that an independent fiscal uh, commission with proper statutory underpinnings and economic forecasting powers will be able to give some clarity to the fiscal position of Northern Ireland in the long term? Uh, thank, uh, thank you for his, his question. There are two propositions at play here. One of them is the Fiscal Council, I think, which, which provides the, uh, the, the type of uh, service he, he's indicating. And I think it is important because uh, one of the issues we have dealt with here for some time is the fact that there isn't clarity around taxes that are, are raised here. Uh, there isn't clarity in terms of some of the bigger corporations that, that do a lot of their business here but actually declare their tax returns in London. Uh, and so there are, and then in terms of our own spend, of course, I think we need uh, to ensure that we are spending well, that we are forecasting uh, as well. And so it appears to me that quite a lot of the information uh, provided or available to an executive or executive departments is limited in terms of its uh, understanding of what uh, our tax returns might be or in terms of spending forecasts. So I think. Uh, any organisation which can assist us in that, I think, would be of benefit. There is a commitment under the new decade, new approach, uh, as there was under previous agreements to establish the fiscal council. There is no real meat on the bones of that as yet. We, we intend to bring forward propositions in relation to that. And also, I know he has asked before, we intend to bring forward a proposition in relation to a fiscal commission, which can look at the uh, tax raising and tax varying powers that might be available to us here. Mr. Framakan. But, uh, uh, thank you very much. And, uh, would the Minister not agree that uh, the member for Lagan Valley uh, has, uh, focuses in on outdated opinion polls uh, that uh, completely distort the opinion of people throughout this, uh, this country? And that the vast majority of opinion polls point in the other direction, and that is not only for a border poll but for Irish unity. But would the Minister 
uh, not uh, advised. Does the Minister agree uh, that there is a need for, uh, to improve uh, data and public finances in the North? Well, I think yes, uh, and I suppose it's in response to my last question in relation to Fiscal Council. Uh, uh, I, I, I do think that, uh, as previously chair of the Economy Committee, I, I was aware that the Department of the Economy in setting its own economic policy hadn't got full access to all the data you would think it would require in terms of uh, projections, in terms of understanding actually the tax produced uh, from within the area of its jurisdiction. So I do think, yes, there is insufficient data. I think we have to look at ways to strengthen that, to find that, and to get access to accurate data. Uh, and that's a job for the executive coming in. In relation to your first points, I notice there's no adage that first they ignore you and then they laugh at you. And I think they're in the second phase of that progress that they're now laughing at you. Mr. Jim Allister. Uh, whereas the Minister's creative accounting may only be exceeded by the creative fiction of Mr. McCann, can I ask the Minister why, in response to Mr. Given, he compared the figure of tax raised with the $21 billion resource spending, instead of comparing it with the figure that is in the OS ONS document of $28 billion of public sector expenditure. That is the gap that, of course, he cannot explain and can never fill, nor the country that he aspires to be part of. Well, I actually had prepared, given our exchange yesterday, I had prepared a further explanation in relation to that. That is, again, another accountancy exercise which actually puts a cost of depreciation against our capital assets, which again is not what I have referred to as money which is available for people to spend here as opposed to taxes which were raised here. The gap is $3.3 billion. Those are ONS figures, so you can't accept one part of them and then dispute the other part. They are very clear in their figures. The additional money you refer to uh, is made up of things like uh, assessing and costing against us the depreciation of our own assets. Call Ms Joanne Bunting. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Question two, please. Uptake of the loan pensioner uh, allowance scheme has increased annually since its introduction in 2008, with $6.99 million being awarded during the 2018-19 rating year. The scheme is jointly administered by Latin Property Services and the Northern Ireland Housing Executive. During 2018-19, LPS provided support to 29,841 loan pensioners who owned and occupied their own homes, which is an increase of 48 per cent on the 29-10 position. LPS regularly attends outreach events such as the Pensioners' Parliament and Young at Heart, where LPS staff take time to explain the relief to citizens who may be eligible to apply. Ms Bunting, for a supplementary. Thank you, uh, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. But 29,000 out of our population and, and the seniority of our population isn't a, isn't a significant number. And I'd like to ask the Minister: Does he find that acceptable? Does he think more can be done? And what will he do to promote this scheme? Uh, well, I, I think, of course, when there are, there are uh, schemes which are available to assist pensioners, and this, bear in mind, this isn't rates or this isn't means tested. Sorry. So it means that it applies to all pensioners. There, there, there are some who may consider they are aware of it, but uh, consider that it doesn't, uh, they don't necessarily need uh, to apply to it or to access it. But what LPS has done, uh, the scheme was first uh, introduced in 2008, and so they have had leaflets inserted uh, and issued with rates bills. Uh, they have get help with rates booklets issued to libraries and GP surgeries. Posters for display in a range of public places include all LPS and housing executive offices. Online help. Uh, through NI Direct web pages and the housing executive websites, partnership working with the voluntary and community sectors, and collaboration with other government departments, such as the Department of Communities Make a Call, uh, through departmental social media channels and Facebook and Twitter, and by attendance at claimant stake stakeholder events. So there have been a range of measures. If uh, the member is aware of, of deficiency, no, I'm more than happy to hear from her. I'm sure LPS would be more than happy to hear from her if you think there are improvements or there are other areas where perhaps they're not reaching into that might yield more people who are entitled to that benefit. Call Mr. Philip McGuigan. Well, good. That's Ken Collier. And can I thank the, the Minister for his answers and for schooling some of the members uh, in this chamber on the finances of the North? And look forward to uh, discussing uh, on other occasions the finances of. Uh, United Ireland. But for today, can I just ask the Minister if he will uh, introduce uh, rates relief for rural ATMs? Uh, well, yeah, the, there was a scheme up, up until very recently which did provide rate relief for rural ATMs, uh, and that I think requires further legislation to continue it on. 
Uh, it's certainly something I would consider, but we're trying to consider the much wider rates uh, schemes in their entirety because uh, clearly what we want to get, there's enormous pressure under certain sectors as a, as a consequence of rates, uh, and we're trying to ensure that we have the fairest possible system. So everything will be in the melting pot, if you like, in that discussion, including for the legislation to extend that rate relief to rural ATMs. Call Mr Mike Nesbitt. Thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker. If I heard the Minister correctly, uh, he said that LPS's outreach includes going to the Pensioners' Parliament. But as I understand it, the Pensioners' Parliament no longer exists because of lack of funds. So would the Minister of Finance like to fund a revival? Well, you can't blame LPS for funding the Pensioners' Parliament. But if, uh, I'm not sure, to be quite honest, how it was funded, uh, but I'd be more than interested. I, I thought I'd some engagement in my own constituency a number of years back. I thought it was a very worthy thing. If you want to be pinned to your collar with questions, uh, the Pensioners Parliament is the place to go, yep. uh, I can tell you, in relation to a whole range of uh, social policy areas. So I, I'm disappointed to hear that it has discontinued, and uh, I'd be more than supportive if somebody bring forward a proposition for reinstatement. Call Mr Jim Allister. Question three. The recent work to revise the text of the Ministerial Code has been led by the Department of Finance with political parties as part of the political talks process and the Transparency, Accountability and Governance Working Group. The latest revisions will detail the accountability of ministers to the Assembly, strengthen declaration of interest requirements and set out that ministers are responsible for the management, conduct and discipline of their special advisers and make clear the need for recording of ministerial meetings and decisions. Mr Allister. The Minister didn't indicate when this ministerial code might come into operation, but I'm really more interested in how robust it will be. Uh, for example, if you had a minister who, after a paramilitary killing in his constituency, described the innocent victim as a criminal in order to take the heat off the organisation that carried out the murder, and if he then vacillated between denying having said that and ultimately apologising for the hurt caused, but never withdrawing the words that the victim was a criminal. Would such a minister be caught and accountable under the ministerial code that this minister is bringing forward? Minister. Well, can I say the, the codes are currently with other executive ministers for consideration, and I expect to be bringing them forward fairly soon. The, uh, one of the recommendations are commissioners who will make uh, recommendations in relation to the behaviour of ministers. Can I say, in relation to the matter he outlines, firstly, he, he is incorrect in his description of what took place, and secondly, incorrect in terms of the motivation of what was said at the time. Call Mr. Colin McGrath. Much, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. Um, whilst I appreciate and understand that the RHI report is not something that's the direct responsibility of the Minister as it's been carried out by the inquiry, what preparations is the Department making to update the House on his Department's uh, interpretation and future actions as a result of it? Well, uh the, the new decade new approach agreement contains a range of proposals, and, and the, the members will know. I'm not sure if he was on the working group, but largely the, the, the codes that have been brought forward since restoration are the product of the engagement over the course of last year, and particularly over the course of last summer, when all of the, or the five political parties were involved that uh, were to make up the executive. So the agreement that flowed from that contained a range of proposals to make government better, including changes to the ministerial code. But it also contains a commitment to further reform to take account of the RHI inquiry. And this would include considering whether any additional changes to the ministerial code are needed following publication of the report to further rebuild public confidence. Call Mr. Pat Sheehan. Can the Minister give a, a clear indication of the timescale of when he expects to produce the civil service code, the revised civil service code? Well, the, uh, the revised civil service code, of course, is the third part of the, the work that has gone forward. Uh, already we've taken forward the, the guidance and code in relation to special advisors. The ministerial code is currently with other executive colleagues for their consideration. I expect it 
uh, to come through an executive process, certainly in the, in the, in the near future. Uh, and the Civil Service Code it will follow on from that. It's my intention uh, to get that work done as quickly as we can in the department, because uh, although the report into RHI will come in the middle of next month, uh, I think that there was a, a clear understanding among all of the parties who were involved in those working groups last summer uh, to get these things done in the Assembly and to get them out as quickly as we can and subject them, if necessary, to further uh, review and further action as a consequence of what the inquiry might recommend. Uh, but certainly I intend to get that work done as quickly as possible. I call Mrs. Sinead Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Question four, please. The Shared Prosperity Fund is being developed by the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government in Whitehall. Despite repeated requests from officials, the pace of development has been very slow, and we still know very little about the design of the fund. I understand that the quantum of the fund and arrangements for its delivery will not be finalised until the spending review, the timing of which has not yet been announced. I have just written to the Chief Secretary of the Treasury setting out our position on the replacement of EU funding, broadly that we want full replacement of our current spending power and that we want the administration arrangements to be as simple as possible and in line with our devolved responsibilities. Ms Bradley for a supplementary. Thank you, and thank you for your answer, Minister. Um, given that it appears that the UK Government will attempt to centralise the priority setting on the administration of the Shared Prosperity Fund, could you tell me what representations you have made to the um, Westminster Government in terms of framing and shaping this to suit people here? Well, I, I, yeah, I, I did touch on it in, in my answer, but uh, I agree with her uh, that we, we have to be very vigilant in relation to the, the shaping and, uh, of not only the amount that is involved, because there is a commitment to ensure that the full amount is, remains available to us from uh, the British Government in terms of the uh, commitments that they have given, but also, as per our devolved role, we have responsibility for administering and distributing and setting the priorities and setting the programmes uh, for this, and we want it to be as, as, as simple as possible, that it isn't a very convoluted mechanism. So I have written, I have not only written myself, but I have written in, in collaboration with the, the finance ministers in Scotland and Wales to the Treasury to make sure that we have a, a, a combined view in this. We are arranging, uh, actually, there's dates been kicked around at the moment, but I am hoping at some stage next week uh, to be over with the other two finance ministers. We meet the Treasury and we will raise these issues because none of the devolved areas are satisfied with what appears to be shaping up, even though there's very little detail or, or uh, uh, very little uh, remit has been put on this idea of a prosperity fund. Uh, but we want to ensure that the replacement of the EU funds come in, in full to us and also in terms of our ability to shape those programmes and to deliver those programmes. Ms. Liz Kimmins. Can I ask the Minister what his thinking would be on the objectives of the new Peace Plus programme, which has been put in place to build on the incredible work of the Peace and Interreg programmes? Well, they're, they're, they I have engaged with SEUPB uh, in relation to what's shaping up in terms of Peace Plus, and of course, uh, I think one of the, the big challenges, besides all the political challenges and the, the challenges in terms of trade, east, west, north, south, uh, that Brexit throws up, and it is the loss of European funding uh, and how important that has been to us for many, many years and, and how many projects have been funded through it. And many, many sectors rely on European funding in order to keep themselves uh, afloat. Mm -hmm. So uh, there is uh, proposals being developed and there is engagement ongoing with Europe. There is, and I welcome the fact that there is a commitment to a peace plus uh, that both Europe and Dublin uh, ourselves and the British Government are committed to. Uh, and so I want to see that develop fully. Uh, I want to make sure that we continue to access uh, the funds that we were, we were entitled to through that. Uh, and I want to make sure that we uh, use that in as best as we possibly can to try and uh, offset the damage that would be caused from the, the loss of funds in a range of other areas. And of course, that's part of the original answer to the question is that we continue to engage with Treasury in relation to replacement of those funds as well. Call Mr. Alan Chambers. Hey, Mr. Speaker. Minister. The Secretary of State brought forward regulations to establish a scheme of payments for individuals injured in the Troubles on 31 January 2020, with a go-live date by the end of May 2020. Decisions will be made by the judicially-led Victims Payment Board. Payments can be up to £10,000 per annum for life and be inherited by a nominee. The Executive Office is currently refining costs for the first year which could be up to 60 million, as well as assessing costs of subsequent ongoing annual payments. 
The subject of victims' payments were included in the new decade new approach negotiations with the British Government via the Secretary of State. Under the Statement of Funding Policy, these are costs that should be borne by the British Government, and I will continue to press for these costs to be met by Treasury. My recent, re recent meeting with Rishi Sunak was constructive, and I hope to engage further with the Treasury in due course. Mr Chambers, for a supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Minister. Uh, Minister, uh, can you give a commitment that there will be uh, no undue delay in commencing payments uh, to the victims? Thank you. Well, I can say that the, the responsibility for processing this falls to the Executive Office, so it's not mine. I'm, I'm trying to deal with the finances of it. I have to say, looking at it, it's very, very challenging to see a judicial-led process in place and delivering funding by the end of May. Uh, but that's the date that has been set, and I don't doubt the Executive Office will try and meet uh, that demand. Uh, of primary interest to myself is the fact that this was a British government led. They established the legislation, they led the policy, and under the statement of funding policy, they should meet the costs, even if it is a matter of transferring that cost to the executive, that the finances to the Executive Office to deliver the payments. It should be met uh, by the British government because they were the lead in it. So that's been my primary focus. But uh, I, I would sincerely hope there's no delay. I know victims have been waiting a very long time on this. Uh, but the, the date of the 1st of May, I, I, I think, in anybody's book, was a very, very challenging date to meet. Commerce is Dolores Kelly. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. D Principal Deputy Speaker. I welcome the Finance Minister's uh, commitment that it is, in fact, the responsibility of the British Government. Can he tell the House whether or not he's made any representation to the British Government on those who are injured uh, uh, by terrorist organisations? Were uh, the likes of Libya funded those terrorist organisations? And does he support uh, the British Government's call for those uh, people to be gone after in terms of uh, putting some money into the pot for victims? Well, I haven't been involved in that type of discussion at all. I know there's similar arguments that have been made in relation to the old South African regime and the, and the support they provided to people, which caused uh, enormous damage to, to victims here as well. Uh, so it's not something I've been involved in myself. It's more a political matter. If the British government want to pursue other countries uh, in relation to a contribution, then that's very much a matter of themselves. <coughs> Our interest is that, as per the statement of funding policy, the British government led on this. They devised the legislation. They brought it through. They should meet the cost. Thank you, Minister, for your answers so far. And I raised this this morning during the debate, and you will have heard that, that, that the British Government does need to bear the responsibility for the cost of this. It is their legislation. It is legislation that ignored much of the advice given to it by the Victims Commissioner and all of the other victims' groups and responses and consultations. Can you confirm if you think that the British Government are going to be forthcoming with this money and if you have had any discussions with them on additional monies in relation to the other le legacy mechan mechanisms, given that there is an acknowledgement that £150 million won't touch it? Well, the, the, uh, firstly, in relation to this, yeah, we will continue to raise these matters with the British government. Uh, and I'm meeting the Treasury on Thursday. Uh, and, and in relation to the e-fund, and then I'll be meeting them the following week, along with the, the Scottish and, and Welsh ministers. Uh, but very clearly, if this scheme, uh, and we have only sort of estimates at the moment, and that's in relation to physical injury that was caused. We have no estimates in relation to mental injury that were caused during the course of the Troubles. Uh, but if this scheme is not properly funded by Westminster, it will have a long-term impact on our local budget, as it would normally take the form of an annual payment, and it can be inherited in circumstances, certain circumstances. So that is not just a significant impact, but it's a long-term impact as well. Uh, in relation to the other legacy mechanisms, uh, of course, there was an agreement to put an additional uh, 100 million, I think, as part of uh, New Deck and New Approach. Uh, which we have yet to see materialise, but even that, according to estimates of what the legacy mechanism calls, still falls short, uh, and so there are ongoing discussions to be had with the government in relation to that. I call Mrs Rosemary Barton. Thank you, Mr Prin Principal Deputy Speaker. Question 6. Uh, a, a dormant account is one where there has been no customer-initiated activity for at least 15 years. Under the Dormant Bank and Built Society Accounts Act 2008, banks and built societies transfer the remaining unclaimed assets to a central reclaim fund. Under the Act, customers still retain the right to reclaim their money and can do this by contacting the reclaim fund directly. A comprehensive reuniting exercise of dormant account holders and their assets was launched by the banks and built societies some 10 years ago, and this has helped to minimise subsequent reclaims. Mrs. Barton, for a supplementary. Thank you. Um, since the publicity on the dormant accounts, can you tell me how many, of the, how many customer account holders have come out of the woods to lay claim to them? 
I, I apologise, I don't have that. That's done centrally. The, the actual the, the dormant accounts uh, is done centrally in Britain and is done for all of, all of the regions as well. Uh, what we will get eventually when all of that is settled, and as I say, there had been uh, quite a promotion to ensure that there was an, an ability for people to claim their entitlement if they, if they somehow missed and that the, the finances in the dormant account were seized. Uh, against their wishes. And, uh, so I've been told it has been minimised. I don't have the numbers for that, and I will, I will endeavour to get them and send them to you. But what we receive here is kind of our share of the dormant accounts, and then we, we attempt to distribute that then uh, to very worthy causes. Call Mr Jerry Kelly. Could I ask the Minister um, if he would uh, give us some, some assurance that the dormant accounts uh, will be used in, for sustainability of uh, social enterprises? Well, the Department of Finance directed the National Lottery Community Fund to establish a dormant account scheme here in September 2019 under three key themes, capacity building, resilience and sustainability. As required by the Dormant Accounts Fund the Act, the Lottery has consulted with the stakeholders as to how a fund could be used here, and the outcome of the consultation will form the basis of a strategic plan, which will be laid in the Assembly, preferably by the end of this financial year. And that will outline how uh, that, that, uh, those broad themes which were agreed will be met in terms of the, the practice of distributing that money here. Call Ms Paula Bradley. Uh, question number seven. Mr. The receipts and expenditure method of valuation of non-domestic rating used by Latin Property Service is the established approach agreed between professional valuation bodies and government valuation bodies in England, Scotland, Wales and also here. All business rates are based on rental value, however, if the evidence of a rent is not available, different approaches are needed to determine the rental value. Anyone wanting to rent a pub or hotel will want to know how it is trading. That is why valuers call for accounts and turnover. Increased values for some pubs and hotels are a result of improved turnovers between 2013 and 2018. If ratepayers believe LPS has got any values wrong, there is a straightforward process to produce the evidence. Unfortunately, the response rate for pubs and hotels to provide information for reval has been poor. Following reval 2020, 40 per cent of pubs will see no change or decrease in their valuation. The Minister, first response, and, and, and thank him especially because I know he spoke about this ad nauseum at his last uh, question time, so I thank him for answering. Um, I just want to uh, bring up the point about so many of our, our local pubs are community hubs within our towns and villages, and I know I've certainly been lobbied as to the, the possibility of some of them having to close. And I just I suppose I want to ask the Minister that communication is kept open with the possibility of appeals or whatever that might be uh, with his department, with those, those that are community hubs um, that, and are acting so within our communities. I can, I can say I get that. I live in a village myself, so I know at once in seven pubs and very little else, but uh, that was because our neighbouring village of Bessbrook didn't have any, uh, <laughs> for religious reasons, but, uh, which was much to, the, much to the benefit of Camelot, I can tell you. But uh, no, I, I, get, uh, uh, I get that businesses are struggling and that we need to make sure the rating system is fair. I did meet as part of a broader delegation with uh, Hospitality Ulster and with the Hotels Federation people as well, and it was made very clear to them uh, that, that, you know, if Firstly, people can challenge and they can appeal uh, the valuations being put on, but also uh, we are trying to encourage a, an uptake in this attempt to provide uh, accounts and turnover uh, as a way of proving whether people had, were doing better business or not. And I know that's uh, kind of in the history of our business. This is not something that people like sharing with government necessarily, but it is a way of challenging uh, if people are making an assessment based on a false assumption. But clearly what we, this is in this exercise and what, what I want to do going into the future is get a complete assessment of all rates and get the fairest possible system so people can see how assessments are arrived at and they can also see what the money is being spent on in relation to the rates gathered. I'll drink to that. Kelly Armstrong. Mr Deputy Speaker, just following on from that, I was wondering, is there any leeway that can be provided? As you have acknowledged yourself, Minister, um, there are a number of rural pubs that are community hubs, as highlighted by Ms Bradley. Um, are there, has there been any rural proofing considered within the Reval um, 2020? Because um, I'm finding that some of my local pubs that are necessary for tourism in the area are facing hardships, which may lead to potential closure. Well, I, I, if, the, if the Reval is based on rentable value, that obviously would take account of the pubs in the middle of a city centre. It obviously is a much higher rentable value than one in the rural community. And it takes account of turnover as well, and if the turnover is provided, 
then perhaps it would show that a rural pub has, has, has quieter times than certainly a, a busy urban uh, centred pub. So th I, I, those things are taken into account. I, I'm not sure that there was a formal rural proofing exercise done because it's a fairly straightforward uh, valuation exercise in terms of the size of the property and the rental value of it. Uh, but I do uh, I know that people have been lobbied extensively, we've all been lobbied in relation to it, uh, and my job is to try and find the fairest possible system. And where people feel that the valuation is incorrect or that they're getting the wrong uh, bill or that it's, 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 it's way above what they should be paying, then there, is, there are opportunities to challenge that and to appeal that. I apologise. I know there was a member looking to get in, but unfortunately the time is gone and we must move on to topical questions. I call Mr Mervyn Storey. Deputy uh, Speaker, can I ask the Minister, yesterday he made much in regards to the shortfall of the public finances and the $600 million. What assurance will he give to the Assembly today that as a result of whatever the outcome of any budget settlement there is, that key to addressing many of the challenges that we face in Northern Ireland is to have adequate resourcing for the police service of Northern Ireland, so that the police service of Northern Ireland can go after with all vigour and all rigour those who are criminals, those who have inflicted murder in our communities and those who have been responsible for some of the most heinous crimes, including that of the murder of Paul Quinn. Well, any bids for resource for the broad justice area, including police service uh, and whatever uh, uh, they consider that they require to carry out their duties, uh, is made through the Department of Justice. Uh, I had a discussion with the Department of Justice, uh, as I did with all ministers, with the Minister for Justice, as I did with all ministers, uh, in the run-up to trying to set a budget for the executive in the coming weeks. Uh, and so I, I'm very clearly aware of what their pressures are. I'm also aware that the uh, new decade, new approach has committed an additional, I think, 600 uh, police officers. The challenge, I suppose, will be finding recruiting those people, getting them in, getting them trained up and getting them out uh, on the streets where they're very much needed. So in line with all departments, uh, the Department of Justice is no different. Uh, I will be trying to make, meet as best I can within the limited resources available, bids from all departments. Those which they declare are very high priorities are inescapable pressures for them. I want to try and meet those bids. I thank the Minister for that, but will he give the specific assurance that the Barnet consequentials, particularly that came as a result of the announcement uh, by the Prime Minister in regards to the additional police officers in the United Kingdom, that that will not be taken and used by the Department of Finance in any other way other than what it is specifically designated for as a Barnet consequential? because he has responsibility for that and not the Department of Justice. Well, the member will know, having previously occupied this position, that Barnet consequentials aren't ring-fenced in that fashion, and they are a matter for the executive to decide uh, as to how they're spent. So if the executive decide to keep those Barnet consequentials for provision of additional policing, then that's an executive decision, and I'm quite happy to abide by that. But it's clearly a matter for the executive to decide how to spend them. Um, can I ask the Minister to update us on what funding will be lost as a result of Brexit? Minister. Well, the, uh, the fund at risk in, in includes CAP, which totaled 2.3 billion euros over the last seven years, the European Social Fund, uh, 210 million over the same period, the Investment, fund, uh, Investment for Jobs and Growth Programme, which is 313 million euros, and access to loans from the European Investment Bank. Uh, thank the Minister for his response, and, and I'm sure I don't need to tell him about the importance of the various EU funding streams right across society here for community and voluntary for agriculture and rural development, but also importantly in terms of research and innovation funding for economic development. <coughs> um, and I'm sure, like me, he's concerned about the loss of access to that. So can I ask the Minister um, what he will be doing in terms of trying to continue to access those funds and what replacement funding will he be seeking? Thank you. Well, as I said in, in, in answer to a question earlier, uh, we, I've written to the Chief Secretary of the Treasury. I, uh, that's alongside having had a discussion with the Scottish and Welsh uh, finance ministers. Uh, we will be meeting jointly with the, the Treasury, I think, uh, hopefully at the tail end of next week, 
Uh, and our position that is we want all EU funding to be fully replaced. That's a commitment that has been given by the British Government uh, that we won't lose out in relation to that. But unfortunately, we know very little as yet about the Shared Prosperity Fund that's been developed by the British Government to replace EU funding. Uh, and the quantum of that funding is not expected to be finalised until the spending review, the timing of which has not yet been announced. But our approach is that we want the full quantum and we also want the ability to administer and to set the programmes for that, as has previously been the case. Uh, in, in conjunction, obviously, with the EU, has previously been the case for uh, EU funding. Can I ask the Minister how much he expects the victim's payment to cost? Minister. The cost estimates are high level at present, but the Executive Office advised that costs in 2021 amount to between 25 and 60 million. Uh, the assumed cost total of of 109 million over the three years from 2021 to 2022 23. Uh, but again, those are estimates because they are, I think the initial estimate is based on a, a number of people who are physically injured as a consequence of the conflict, not people who perhaps have been uh, received other uh, damage as a consequence of the conflict. And so uh, it is very much a guesstimate uh, at this moment in time. Um, can I ask the Finance Minister on his view as to where this funding should come from? Well, the, uh, I, I base my, my, my view on this in relation to the is a statement of funding policy which applies to our finances and finances in, in devolved areas in Scotland and Wales, and that makes it clear that the body whose decision leads to additional cost will meet that cost. And the decision to provide this was done by the British Government. Uh, and and on, under that, then, very clearly, the, the, the rules of the funding policy state that they meet that cost. It, it, it was legislated for them. It, the decision maker on the policy was the British Government. And therefore, in my view, it's the British Government's responsibility to fund the victims' payment scheme. Can the Minister outline his plan to support the uh, social enterprise? Well, I had the great pleasure of engaging with the social enterprise sector last night down in City Hall in the, uh, in the social enterprise cafe that's in City Hall. So uh, plans, and we discussed these in, in a, a number of roundtable uh, discussions last night with them, but plans to include social value legislation so that social enterprises can compete for government contracts on a level playing field, using the dormant accounts funds to support social enterprise and create sustainability. Uh, we've been doing some work with the Department for Communities in relation to community asset transfer. Uh, and we will continue to see where we can work, not just within the Department of Finance, but actually across uh, departmental to, to uh, assist the social enterprise mm -hmm. sector who, who performs such a valuable role. Uh, How does the Minister intend to improve the community as asset transfer policy, as he mentioned in his uh, answer to me? Well, as I say, we have met with the Communities Minister and uh, both Permanent Secretaries uh, on that and a range of other issues, but certainly Community Asset Transfer was on that agenda. We are working on a range of improvements to make it easier to identify assets and then to also transfer those assets. We are also considering how social enterprise can be supported to manage assets over the long term. Topical question number five in the name of Mr David Hilditch has been withdrawn, so I therefore call Ms Gemma Dolan. Can the Minister provide an update on the Translation Hub? Well, as the Member will know, the Translation Hub, along with the Irish language legislation and, and other legislation in relation to cultural issues, was uh, part of the discussions that led up to the agreement of the New Decade New Approach. Uh, the, the, there is a, a responsibility provided on the Department of Finance uh, to deliver the translation hub within the three-month period identified in the New Decades New Approach document. Uh, and that's the work that we will be undertaking. I met with Conor Nagelaga recently to discuss best practice in relation to how translation hubs uh, operate, and we will be uh, inputting that information and that discussion into the Department's work to get this done within the time frame outlined. Thank you, and I thank the Minister for his answer. Um, can the Minister also update us on the commitment in the New Decade New Approach deal um, that births, marriages and deaths can be registered in Irish? Yes, this is another area of work that we have been tasked with undertaking. Uh, I have asked my officials to begin work on this, and I hope to be in a position very shortly to update the Assembly on progress in relation to this. 
Minister, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, you will be aware of a number of critical reports around skills deficit among senior civil servants around uh, capital bill projects. Have you had any discussions or what action do you intend to take to redress this? Well, yeah, I am aware of the uh, Audit Office report on, on uh, capital projects, which is critical in, in relation to their delivery. Uh, I think we always have lessons to learn uh, when there is an Audit Office report has, has come out. Uh, and a former member of the Public Accounts Committee, I am very aware of the work that goes into them. The Procurement Board, which I chair, will meet on the 1st of April, and I intend to have the Audit Office report discussed and direct Procurement Board to commence a review of the role of procurement in delivering major capital projects, because that is a responsibility within my own department. Obviously, there are a range of issues that go into other departments, but procurement has a key role to play in that, and I ensure, want to ensure the Department of Finance plays its role in that. I wonder if the Minister might elaborate on whether or not the Strategic Investment Board and what role it has to play in the delivery of capital projects, given the underspend there has been to date. Well, the Strategic Investment Board will provide a, a, an advisory function across all of the departments, and, and of course they have key experience in relation to that. And I think we, we should always be looking to where we find a kind of skills deficit that you have outlined, and if this report clearly identifies that that was one of the failings then that we, we look to supplement that. Some of that I think can be found through the skills that exist in the Strategic Investment Board, uh, but other that other we may need to look outside and try and ensure we can recruit that in. But, Yes, the Strategic Investment Board. Uh, I know my department has already been in discussion with them, and I am sure other departments who are criticised in relation to the, the capital projects will be in, in touch with them as well, because they will be a source of advice for everyone. Call Mr. Jerry Carroll. Openness and transparency is a key remit under the Minister's department, and that the executive parties have consistently stated how the British government have reneged on spending arrangements given the parties involved in the new decade, new approach agreement. Can the Minister now detail to the Chamber and the public what exactly these financial commitments were? Because I think the lack of transparency around this matter is somewhat concerning. Well, I don't think there's any lack of transparency in relation to what the commitments were. The lack of transparency is in relation to the British Government meeting the costs of those commitments. Uh, and, uh, you know, in the earlier debate today, some members talked about you know, people coming with wish lists. And bear in mind, we all came to this process together, all five parties and the executive, through a, a, a very uh, structured piece of work with senior officials in the finance department, senior civil servants, uh, and senior officials in the NIO to come up uh, with a list in which we were told uh, was certainly achievable. Uh, the British government's reluctance to provide figures to all of that and then to abruptly call an end to the negotiation has left the uncertainty in relation to all of that. So I continue. I have done an exercise since I have come in about costing the proposals that they uh, committed to, because it's their document, uh, costing that, and I intend to engage with Treasury this week again in relation to trying to secure the necessary finances to meet those commitments. I think it's obviously concerning that there's commitments in the new deck and new approach that haven't been uh, budgeted prop, uh, adequately for, and there's obviously talk about funding gaps of several hundreds of millions of, uh, of pounds. Will the minister uh, commit to do all he can to ensure that the British government does live up to its commitments? Well, that's what I've been doing, uh, and that's why the exercise was undertaken in the first instance, to, uh, because we were told by the uh, NIO that that negotiation was over. That was your money, and that was it. So we, we didn't accept that, uh, and I, I undertook a, a, an exercise of costing those commitments across the department. Some of them were across departmental work. It took some time to get those costs together, and I went over and engaged with Treasury on the basis of that. It was a fairly positive engagement. Uh, we, enga we intend to go back, uh, and I'm going back this week. Uh, to continue that and continue discussions in Whitehall generally in relation to that. So I certainly have not given up on pursuing that, uh, and I'm glad that I have the support of all my executive colleagues in doing that, and I hope that we have something to show, because we delivered politically in terms of the commitments we all made, the five parties made under the, the new decade, new approach. I mean, uh, we couldn't simply approach that politically and say, well, we signed up that, but actually we didn't mean any of that. So the British government can't disengage financially from the commitments they made. I've got a free last count quarter. Uh, thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, could I ask the Minister um, if the money he allocated for people affected by the contaminated blood scandal is being spent in the way that it's intended to be? Well, as you know, we, we allocated uh, £1 million as part of the monitoring round uh, for people affected uh, by the contaminated blood scandal. 
The, uh, this has been an ongoing issue and a tragic issue for quite a lot of the families involved, and I think it was essential uh, that at the first opportunity we got, uh, we demonstrated some support for them. Uh, I know the Department of Finance, having received the money, uh, have, have uh, allocated 600,000 of that 1 million, but the Finance, or the Health Minister, sorry, uh, the Department of Health have allocated that money. The Health Minister has assured me that they intend to use the full million uh, in relation to contaminated blood scabbing. Uh, um, could, is the Minister aware of just how many people in the north here have been affected by this scandal? There are figures, uh, and I am certainly in, in, in consultation with my colleague, the Health Minister, to try and get those figures to you. Thank you very much, Members. That concludes questions to the Minister for Finance. We now move on to questions to the Minister.